Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Managing Symptomatic Fibroids with Uterine Fibroid Embolization, UFE. In today's webinar, Dr. Lippman will discuss fibroid facts, what you thought you knew about hysterectomies, uterine fibroid embolization, facts, approach, results, advantages, and disadvantages. To give you a little background about our presenter, Dr. John C. Lippman is a nationally recognized fibroid and women's health expert. He has given more than 200 invited lectures on uterine fibroids, including with Harvard, Yale, Morehouse, and Stanford Medical Centers. Dr. Lippman performed his radiology residency with Brigham and Women's Hospital and was the chief resident at Harvard Medical School. He has also been awarded a plethora of prestigious fellowships and has authored an abundance of industry works. Attendees who require a passcode, the word for today is fibroid. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list to the left of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Dr. Littman, the presentation is now turned over to you. Great. Thank you very much, and thanks, everyone, for attending. I hope you'll find this uh, interesting and provocative, and maybe you'll uh, learn some new uh, and important uh, information. I'm going to be talking about managing fibroids with a procedure called UFE, uterine fibroid embolization. It's also called UAE. They're the same procedure. Um, women who are suffering with uterine fibroids often don't hear about this procedure, and it's really unfortunate because it's one of the biggest medical breakthroughs for women. Um, in terms of significance, I would rank it up there with a the mammogram and the pap smear, yet women who are suffering with fibroids often don't hear about this as an option um, largely because they see their gynecologist, and the gynecologist may or may not mention this procedure at all, um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, it's a lack of awareness uh, uh, by the patient who unfortunately doesn't get the information typically from her gynecologist, uh, and women don't want surgery. It's clear that they don't. They want less invasive options, um, and over a million women in the United States suffer in silence with these benign tumors. They cause some pretty disabling symptoms in a lot of women, and we'll talk about those symptoms. Uh, but 3,000 women every day in this country succumb to surgery. They, they can't put up with the symptoms anymore, and they decide to have surgery, uh, typically hysterectomy. Um, most of these hysterectomy surgeries are completely unnecessary. Fibroids are benign tumors. They're not cancer. Uh, so why are these patients undergoing surgery? Well, they're suffering. Um, and they trust their gynecologist. They may have known them for years. They may have delivered their children. And when they tell them that there's not any other option available, they, they look no further. And um, that's unfortunate because there is this great option available for women, uh, and we'll talk further about it. Um, the UFE procedure solves the problem. Uh, um, and, and if we could just inform these patients that there is an, an alternative to surgery, it would be a great thing. And that's what we try to do every, every day and educate patients and provide them this information. It does require them to go to a specialist, an interventional radiologist. Uh, those are the types of physicians that perform this UFE procedure. Um, gynecologists uh, do not. Some facts about fibroids. As I mentioned, they're a benign tumor, and it's the most common pelvic tumor in women. In fact, one of every three women in this country, and up to 80% of adult African-American women have these benign tumors. It's extremely common. Um, it's the most common reason why women have abnormally heavy menstrual flows. Um, they may get episodes of blood literally gushing out like a faucet, flooding, clots, accidents, soiling clothes and linens and blood. It can be very embarrassing. Um, it can often keep people um, in their house for a couple of days each month. They can't work. They can't go out. They don't want to be around people because they don't know when the, these big accidents are going to hit. Um, because they've lost so much blood or lose so much blood every month, they become anemic and weak. 
Uh, they may get lightheaded or dizzy. They may get migraine-like headaches or palpitations. They may chew or crave ice. That's a common symptom. And it can be just very disabling, as you might understand, uh, to their day-to-day -day living and uh, intimacy with their uh, significant other, their just psychological well-being. It's just everything they do is tied to their menstrual. It's just very disabling. Um, they can also get other symptoms besides bleeding. These tumors are hard and firm to the touch, and they can press on things to cause other symptoms. They can press on pelvic nerves to cause pelvic pain and bloating and pressure, back pain uh, radiating into the hips and buttock. If they press on the bladder, they cause urinary frequency, and women will often wake up multiple times a night, like their husband with a prostate condition. Um, if it's near the cervix, they may, it may press on the cervix to cause painful intercourse, and even constipation if it presses on the colon. Well, the fibroids are located in kind of three general areas in the uterus. We're looking at a coronal view of the uterus. Um, you can see three fibroids outlined here, and they're in different locations. The submucosal ones are up against the lining. They cause the heavy bleeding. The subserosal fibroids are at the edge, the outer edge of the uterus. They cause more of the bulk and pressure symptoms pushing on things. And then the intramural, depending on which way they grow, if they grow toward the lining, they, they tend to cause more bleeding like the submucosal variety. If they grow outwardly, they tend to cause more bulk-related symptoms, or they can grow in both directions and do both things. Some facts about hysterectomy. It's the second most common surgery performed in the United States, which is kind of staggering because half the population, i.e. men, aren't even eligible. Over 600,000 of these hysterectomies are done every year in the United States. Um, one of every four women in this country has already lost their uterus by the age of 40, and one of every three women have lost their uterus by age 60. The average age of a woman undergoing hysterectomy is less than 40 years of age. And the number one reason why women are getting hysterectomies by far is fibroids. And it's just, as I said, completely unnecessary. We do not need to be operating on these young women and taking away their uterus uh, for a benign indication. If it's uterine cancer, hysterectomy is absolutely appropriate, no question. But we're doing this far too commonly for benign conditions in young women. Here's a couple of opinions about hysterectomy from gynecologists themselves. Um, one at the top is from Jennifer Ashton. She's been on uh, The Doctors and is a medical correspondent for Dr. Oz and CBS. Uh, hysterectomy is one of the most overprescribed, unnecessary surgeries performed in North America, yet we do th over 3,000 of them every day. And then the other is the fact uh, from Dr. King, the fact that 90% of hysterectomies are unnecessary. Worse, a surgery can have long-lasting physical, emotional, and sexual consequences that can undermine your health and well-being. And, and that's something that really isn't talked about, there, and we'll get to that in a moment, but there is an impact for women losing your uterus. I've heard all, this, all the time from patients saying, well, my doctor told me I'm not interested in having children, so I just should have my uterus out. Well, your uterus has important functions beyond just bearing you children, uh, so it's really important to keep your parts. Here's some medical papers for those interested in uh, looking up kind of the science, but Michael Broder is a gynecologist out in California, um, wrote an article about how the majority of hysterectomies are done for inappropriate medical reasons. Um, and then the other is a reference from the American College of Gynecology last year saying that 40% of hysterectomies for women less than 40 are completely unnecessary. As I mentioned just a minute ago, there's some significant effects for women who undergo hysterectomy. Um, first being that they undergo a surgery, so the surgery itself has a morbidity, which is a fairly fairly common 30% morbidity rate uh, for women undergoing hysterectomy. Typically, it's, it's bleeding or wound issues. Um, there's a 9, it, 9 to 10% complication rate, um, nick in a bowel, nick in a ureter, um, and I'll show you some complications in a moment. And there's even a death rate, one in a thousand. So um, we just don't need to be doing any of that. But those things are often talked about. They'll explain, the doctor will often explain the risks of undergoing hysterectomy. But the, the rest of it is not really being explained. What's the psychological impact, the sexual impact of a woman 
undergoing hysterectomy. Those, those issues are rarely talked about, and, it, and it, it's real. I mean, a number of women struggle psychologically, just like a man being castrated. A lot of women struggle sexually, loss of libido, loss of orgasm. Um, it's a very significant and, uh, and, and not trivial matter. Um, a lot of women do struggle sexually after hysterectomy. We know the uterus is important in bone health. Women who have hysterectomies have a much higher incidence of osteoporosis. Um, they have a higher incidence of urinary leaking. Um, and now we know that the uterus is important in cardiovascular health, particularly young women, less than age 50. Here's a couple of complications from hysterectomy on the left. Uh, they, you can see all those surgical clips uh, next to the ureter that's being injected with contrast. Um, and you can see the ureter fills and then abruptly cuts off. You don't see it go into the bladder because one of those many clips that you see there has actually clipped the ureter shut. Um, next to it is a cut ureter. The ureter is right in the field and can get nicked. And this particular patient had a nicked ureter, and she fistulized from her ureter into the vagina. And you can see the vagina is that triangular filling with contrast. So she had a abnormal communication once they nick the ureter between the ureter and the vagina. And obviously that's having urine coming out your vagina uh, was pretty disabling and required the interventional radiologist uh, to help with that. Here's another patient that the bowel was nicked and, and there was a large uh, abscess in the abdomen that needed to be drained uh, by the interventional radiologist. Here's some uh, uh, a reference for psychological impact on women that lose their uterus. This was written by a woman who actually underwent hysterectomy uh, and really struggled and she uh, the, wrote a book about her struggles and then talking to lots and lots of other women that had hysterectomies and their struggles. Um, and, the, and she, a couple of quotes from her book I, I listed here, common thread between the hundreds of women I spoke to were feelings of betrayal. Um, they weren't given all their options about um, treatment and um, a number of these women found out about UFE after they were operated on, they felt betrayed. Um, and they didn't want surgery, but they weren't given any other options. Um, although the uterus itself is only a fraction of a woman's gender identity, its presence or absence is part of how she relates to the world around her. Obviously, the, the uterus is the epicenter of womanness, and so we can understand how losing it would impact women psychologically. Um, mentioned sexual dysfunction. And again, these things are difficult to talk about sometimes. It's an embarrassing subject, and people feel like they're the only ones um, going through this. But hopefully with... Um, increased education and people talking, particularly amongst families, because it will run in families, uh, fibroids. It, hopefully women can talk to each other frankly about some of these issues. Um, I mentioned about the increased incidence of bone loss. Uh, because there's a disproportionate number of African American women suffering with fibroids, um, they also typically have issues with insufficient vitamin D um, due to the melanin and pigment of their skin. That's how we absorb vitamin D through sunlight um, which gets converted in the liver um, and produces the active form of vitamin D. Um, and so they already have insufficient vitamin D in a lot of cases, and you now have added on a, a markedly increased risk of osteoporosis on top of that, which, again, is completely unnecessary. This is an advertisement I found very fascinating. Um, it's for Depends, and you can see um, this woman is wearing an adult diaper. Now, my image of, of people that need adult diapers or grandma and grandpa. Um, but here you can see Madison Avenue knows exactly the kind of woman that is wearing adult diapers. It's an African-American woman, very attractive, probably in her 40s. Um, she's a woman that's had hysterectomy for fibroids, presumably. Um, she's the, you know, why else would a young woman be wearing a diaper? So here's um, Madison Avenue identifying their target audience um, and they found that very interesting. This is an article about uh, hysterectomy and increased cardiovascular risk, particularly in younger women less than age 50. This was an interesting study done a couple years ago uh, by uh, Elizabeth Stewart, uh, one of the uh, leading gynecologists in the country. Um, and they were very surprised by the results, but they were not surprising to me at all. Um, they studied around 1,000 women with fibroids, um, and they found out that 
the mean time to, for them to come forward to get treated was over three and a half years, and a third of them roughly waited over five years, and they, were, they couldn't get over, they couldn't believe the results. Why were these people waiting so long? Well, when they inquired further on why they waited, the vast majority of women didn't want surgery, they didn't want hysterectomy at all, and they weren't given any other option other than surgery. Uh, and most of them, the vast majority of them, were un completely unaware of this UFE procedure that I'll talk about in a moment, which is completely non-surgical. This was an article I was interviewed in, uh, as you can see, back in 2004. At that time, I had been performing UFE for uh, 10 years. So this was something that was, again, at that time, um, front page news on the Wall Street Journal um, that this hysterectomy alternative was going unmentioned to many women um, and gynecologists weren't um, talking about UFE. Um, but nothing has changed in the past 12 years. And it's now obviously 2016 and nothing has changed. We're, um, we're still having the same issue of people just not being aware that this UFE even exists. There are some other studies to corroborate what we have already seen in our practice, a study from Yale uh, showing that only 5% of gynecologists met, even mentioned UFE as an option for women suffering with fibroids. Um, there's an OBGYN medical text uh, that I quoted where when compared with hysterectomy and myomectomy, the overall complication rate, uh, morbidity, mortality rates with UFE are much lower. Um, a review in OBGYN stated that UFE must be included as an option in the course of developing a management plan for women with these fibroids, but clearly this is not being done. And then lastly, uh, a, an article written by a gynecologist called UFE, a hidden alternative, um, he stated that it was his opinion that it was a financial issue that each UFE was, that was performed in lieu of the GYN being uh, operating um, was about a $1,000 financial loss to the gynecologist. Um, I hope that that's not the incentive or why people aren't hearing about UFE, but um, it certainly raises an interesting point. Uh, and with that, I'll stop for questions. Now we are entering the Q&A session. During this time, please enter the passcode into the Q&A widget to the left of your screen. The passcode is fibroid. Also, enter any questions that you may have for Dr. Littman into the Q&A widget as well. The first question that we have is, why do African-American women disproportionately suffer with fibroids? Well, there's two reasons. One, it genetically runs stronger um, in African-American families. So genetically is, the, is, one ish, is one reason. The other has to do with body fat. One of the few things, we don't know where fibroids come from, how they begin, but one of the things we do know is that they grow with estrogen stimulation. Estrogen and progesterone make fibroids grow. That's why they grow sometimes very rapidly during pregnancy and why they tend not to be an issue for women in menopause. Estrogen is essentially stored in body fat, or body fat is an, another source of estrogen. And so if you look at uh, body fat by race, um, African-American women have more body fat than Latino, than Caucasian, than Asian. Asians have the lowest body fat and also have the lowest incidence of fibroids. So you can't pick your parents. You can't do anything about the genetic uh, reasons, but you can work on the extra body fat. And it's just another reason why to try to, and we encourage our patients to exercise, lose any excess body fat, try to be as close to their ideal body weight as you can. And if you lose that excess weight and, and that excess body fat, um, it'll also not only help your fibroid health and your fibroid symptoms, but it'll obviously help your overall health. Okay, the next question is, I suffered with fibroids and had a surgical myomectomy and my symptoms have come back. She said I needed another myomectomy or hysterectomy. Could I also be considered for UFE? Absolutely. Um, Myomectomy is surgically cutting out some of the fibroids, and the problem with myomectomy often is the surgeon can't get all the fibroids out and still have an intact uterus when they're done. And so they'll take the, some of the larger fibroids out or the fibroids they feel they could safely get out, but they leave the woman with living fibroids in her uterus, and those living fibroids will grow over time, 
and then they're right back where they started, somewhere in the three to five year time time frame. So you're, you could have a one myomectomy, but anything after that I would consider UFE. So yes, we've seen a lot of women that have had previous myomectomies. Unfortunately, we've seen a number of women with multiple myomectomies, and that's really tragic. But um, the short answer is absolutely. She could have UFE, and that is a global therapy. It treats every fibroid in the uterus, all of them, whether you have one or 100. What are the side effects of the UFE procedure? There are a couple of risks in undergoing UFE. Um, the first is that there are some women that don't menstruate again permanently after embolization. Now, I've performed well over 6,000 of these UFE procedures myself. Um, I have never seen anyone under the age of 40 that didn't have a menstrual afterwards. And as they get older, that risk will start to increase. So 41 to 45, about 1 to 2%, 45 to 50, 5 to 10%, 50 and, 50 and above, maybe 20%. So as a woman gets closer to her menopausal age, the risk will increase. But fortunately, I've never seen anybody under 40, and usually it's that category of patient that might be interested in fertility. So um, that's one risk. The other risk is what's called retained fibroid slough. Um, about 5% of women will temporarily slough some fibroid material vaginally with their menstrual, maybe one cycle, maybe a couple cycles, and it peters out. And that's okay, as long as she knows it's not anything worrisome. But retained fibroid slough is where the material wants to come out but won't. Um, and it has required um, a DNC to deliver that material out. And I've seen 15 women in the over 6,000 where they needed this DNC procedure to deliver fibroid material out. How many procedures have you performed? Uh, well over 6,000. Supposedly, I have the world's largest experience in UFE. Um, Why do health care providers push for full hysterectomy rather than an alternative for women in childbearing years? Um, well, I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm guessing it's been 20 years now since we've been doing UFE, um, and it's taken a long time for even... Um, the gynecology community to even acknowledge the success of UFE. Um, it's been reluctant and um, it's unfortunate. It's essentially, it boils down to a turf issue. The, largely the, the gynecologists are the gatekeepers for women's health and see these patients. And while I see gynecology referrals, I see a number of patients referred to me from gynecologists. Um, the vast majority of gynecologists are still not providing sufficient information to patients and telling them about UFE um, and only giving them information about the surgery that they can perform for them. And that's why I'm glad I'm here on this webinar and, and other places just trying to educate people that there is an alternative. You do not have to undergo surgery. Thank you. We are done with the questions for now. Dr. Littman, you can continue on with your presentation. Great. Well, here's just some uh, position papers by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology so that you see that they do finally do acknowledge UFE. Uh, it, we started doing UFE in 1994-95, um, and finally a position paper in 2008 stated that based on long-term and short-term outcomes, UFE is safe and effective for women um, who want to retain their uterus. And I would argue, I would think every woman would want to keep their uterus if they could. Um, the other is um, another position statement from the Ethics Committee saying that physician might present only information on risks and benefits of a procedure he or she thinks will lead the patient to make the right decision, in quotes. This model is not appropriate when the patient is competent to make informed decisions, and I would agree. Um, but most patients that go to their physicians um, are competent. And so they should be informed of all of their options and not um, only the options that they can provide. This is uh, some comments what patients are saying about UFE. Um, they're all four different patients. The first, I was appalled that my well-respected 
young and bright female African-American OBGYN offered me no alternatives from total hysterectomy. Second, without hearing from a friend about UFE, I wouldn't have had this great procedure. I'm so grateful I would have either suffered or ended up succumbing to a hysterectomy that my GYN recommended. When I approached my GYN about UFE, she couldn't understand my reluctance and was determined I needed a hysterectomy, and the patient underwent UFE and is doing great. And the last one, I originally accepted hysterectomy. After all, it's, my gynecologist said I'd be much relieved. I canceled at the last minute due to a conflict. I did some research on my own, and I found UFE, and I went back um, and, and asked my gynecologist about this, and she said, oh, you want to try UFE? Well, she told me two months ago my only option was hysterectomy. Needless to say, I'm going to find a new gynecologist. And I, I've seen that in my practice where patients feel very betrayed about this, and they will break a bond even of many years um, uh, when they're not told their options and, and kind of forced into one option. Here is such a patient that um, was provided this letter after she was told she needed a hysterectomy for fibroids, and uh, clearly she, she didn't want hysterectomy, and she found out about UFE and decided to pursue UFE and then received a very um, disappointing letter from her gynecologist dismissing her from his practice, which um, is just egregious. Um, these are some facts about fibroid embolization. It's a completely outpatient procedure. The patients go home the same day with just a Band-Aid, and that's it. Um, it has a long track record of safety and efficacy and very high patient satisfaction. 90% um, or more of patients get significant or complete relief of all of their symptoms. It's covered by every insurance company. Um, insurance coverage is not an issue, and it's available throughout the United States. Uh, the biggest issue is that, as I've mentioned a number of times, that the physicians are not telling patients of all their options, and um, a number of gynecologists are only mentioning surgery. If you look at the two procedures, UFE versus hysterectomy, hysterectomy is often um, several days in the hospital uh, done under general anesthesia. It's a major abdominal surgical procedure with surgical risks, as I mentioned earlier, anesthetic risks, and sometimes pretty big incisions. Um, we see a number of women with very big fibroids and big uteruses and making their uterus look four and five and six months pregnant. And so the, to get these uter big uteruses out, sometimes you have to do vertical incisions from the breastbone to the hairline vertically. And again, these are young women, women less than age 40 with these really large incisions um, to get a big uterus out. Um, some of the women can get less invasive laparoscopic surgery or robotic surgery, um, but that's not the typical patient. That's a much less um, minority of patients. Um, so the recovery is going to be lengthy, weeks, sometimes two months, sometimes more than two months recovery. Um, and you lose your uterus, as I mentioned. There's an impact for losing your uterus versus UFE, which is outpatient, completely non-surgical, no general anesthetic. The anesthetic is local and intravenous. Patients go home with a Band-Aid. There's about a five-day recovery at home. Uh, they may be out of work a week. Um, and most importantly, you get to keep your uterus. This is a schematic of the approach and how we enter the where you feel your pulse at the top of your right leg, just like an interventional cardiologist might use that same approach to catheterize blood vessels of the heart. We're using the same approach to catheterize the blood vessels of the uterus. There's a main uterine artery on either side, um, and that main uterine artery branches like a tree, getting smaller and smaller branches to get out to the leaves. The fibroids are the leaves of the tree, and I can flow direct these tiny particles out to the fibroid, and every fibroid gets um, knocked out. So whether you have one or 100, you knock the blood supply out to all these fibroids, whereas the the uterus stays alive, the main trunk and the big branches, the main um, stays open, so the uterus uh, stays alive, but every fibroid in the uterus gets knocked out. This is just some actual uh, pictures from a real case uh, that we treated. Um, you, can, you can see on the left-hand image, um, you get the sense that there's a, a number of these circles. You can see each of these, there's lots of very small branches feeding um, several of these main fibroids on the left, and then 
a few minutes later after the particles have been delivered, you don't see those branches anymore. You see the main uterine artery, uh, but none of those tiny branches are evident. And without a blood supply, these fibroids will soften and shrink, and as they do, a woman's symptoms uh, disappear. This is um, from the other side. I showed you the left just a moment ago. This is the right uterine, and you can see a number of fibroids. You can see the branches kind of splayed at the, the periphery of each of a number of these fibroids on the left, and then a few minutes later, all you see is the main uterine filling and none of those small branches. Um, this is some imaging showing on the left a woman with a very, very big solitary fibroid at the top of her uterus. You can see it's bulging her belly out, making her look pregnant. You can barely see her belly button at the top of the image on the left, top left corner. Her uterus is almost up to her belly button um, on the left. And then six months later, you can barely see that fibroid. Her uterus is now normal in size completely. Um, and most importantly, all of her symptoms have disappeared. Here's another lady, um, again, on the left, you can see her bladder filling in white, um, and then very centrally to the uterus, that big black circle is a fibroid, and right above it, that white line is the cavity of her uterus. Um, she's, you can, this fibroid is stretching the lining of the uterus, um, causing horrific heavy flows, and then six months later, you can, again, barely see this fibroid. All of her symptoms have disappeared. So the results are outstanding for UFE. Over 90% of women get significant or complete resolution of their symptoms, whether it's heavy bleeding, pelvic pain or pressure, urinary frequency, what have you. There's no limit for size or number. You could have one or 100. You can have big fibroids, small fibroids. Um, and it's typically a one-time procedure, unlike myomectomy, as I mentioned earlier, where you can take out some of the fibroids, but typically a lot of cases you can't take out even the majority of fibroids in the uterus and the ones that they've left behind surgically grow and within three to five years they're back. Um, with UFE, you treat all the fibroids and knock them all out and the chance of you doing a, a UFE more than once is very unusual. So the advantages of doing the UFE, it treats all the fibroids in the uterus, it's very effective. For the symptoms, it's minimally invasive. I said the procedure times are short, a matter of 30 to 45 minutes. Complications are extremely uncommon and rare. Um, there's a very short recovery. It's typically a one-time procedure. There's no surgery at all, no, no general anesthesia, no blood loss. There's no need for transfusion, which is common during myomectomy. It's a very bloody procedure. If you want to see something pretty gory, go to YouTube and look at a myomectomy. Um, all the insurance companies cover the procedure, and importantly, you get to keep your parts. Disadvantages of UFE, um, there is pain afterwards, and some people have a pretty rough go with pain, but um, most people it's very well tolerated and managed with uh, narcotic medication and prescription strength ibuprofen. Um, it's done under x-ray, um, and so that's why it's really important to go to a place that has a lot of experience with UFE, because the longer it takes to do the procedure, the more x-ray exposure, but the x-ray times uh, in my hands are a matter of a few minutes, um, three or four minutes, six minutes, um, typically, um, and so that's a very low uh, x-ray exposure, similar to what you might find in other x-ray uh, imaging um, that either CAT scan or other fluoroscopic procedures. As I mentioned earlier, there's uh, some women that will not menstruate again permanently after UFE. Again, I've never seen it in anybody under 40, um, but even in women over 40, um, until you get over 50, the percentage is really low. Um, we've had 15 patients and well over 6,000 need the gynecologist's help to actually deliver some fibroid material out. So in conclusion, uh, most women suffering with uterine fibroids are not informed of all their treatment options. They're only informed of the surgical choices. And this has clearly led to a lot of unnecessary surgery, particularly hysterectomy. Um, and we need to do a better job. I mean, we need to stop all these unnecessary hysterectomies. UFE is safer than surgery. It's less invasive. 
It's less expensive. It has a much shorter recovery. And very importantly, and relatively underappreciated, it allows women to keep a very important organ uh, that they were born with, their uterus. It does require a second opinion from an experienced interventional radiologist, but there are intervent interventional radiologists all across the country um, that can provide this service. And with that, I will uh, take some additional questions. We are entering the Q&A session. Please enter the passcode into the Q&A widget to the left of your screen. The passcode is fibroid. Also, enter any final questions that you may have for Dr. Littman into the Q&A widget now. So the first question we have is where and when was this procedure developed? And are you suggesting that in the absence of cancer, it is malpractice to perform a hysterectomy without offering the patient this treatment option? Okay, let me take the first question first. When, where did this, this, it got discovered um, kind of serendipitously as a lot of things in medicine uh, do. Um, we have been embolizing tumors for many years. Um, embolization for fibroids started around 94, 95, but uh, early 90s. Uh, but we had been embolizing tumors well, beyond, well before that, typically cancerous tumors, um, embolizing them prior to surgery. For instance, um, kidney cancer is a very vascular malignancy, and we'll be asked to go into the blood supply of the kidney and embolize it um, prior to surgery to make it an easier operation, a quicker surgery, less anesthetic time. Um, and so uh, someone in France got the idea of, well, why don't we embolize fibroids prior to hysterectomy? That would make it an easier, quicker surgery. Um, and so it, it, made, it made sense. It's not something that um, had ever been done in this country uh, before, but it was a certainly interesting idea and a kind of a take on what we had been doing for malignant tumors. And so a group in France started embolizing patients, and in France they have a socialized healthcare system unlike this country, or at least currently. Um, and so they would, they would be embolized with their interventional radiologist and they would wait six, seven, eight weeks for their elective surgery. Well, what happened? Well, over that six or seven, eight weeks while the patient was waiting for their elective hysterectomy, their symptoms went away. And so they would call their gynecologist in France and say, you know, I feel great. My periods are normal now. Uh, I'm not having that pain anymore. I'm, essentially, all of their fibroid-related symptoms had disappeared and so they were wondering, do I really need that second part? Do I need to undergo that hysterectomy? And the answer was no, they didn't. Um, and that gynecologist called a friend of his, the chief of gynecology at UCLA, who then got Scott Goodwin, an interventional radiologist at UCLA, to perform the first uh, fibroid embolization in this country. Um, and that was, again, back in the early to mid-'90s. Um, and we've been doing uterine fibroid embolization ever since. Um, the second question was, if a patient wasn't informed about UFE, is that malpractice? Did I get that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, patients um, under the informed consent rules, patients are supposed to get informed consent, which means they are supposed to get information on all available treatment options that are reasonable, and obviously UFE would be very reasonable for any patient suffering with symptomatic fibroids. So yes, they, they should be hearing, based on informed consent, they should be hearing about UFE. And as I mentioned during the talk, um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has said as such, but clearly what's happening out in you know the real world is not what is being stated that they need to do that. And so there's, there's a disconnect between what should be done uh, and what is being done in, in the vast majority, not in every case, but in the majority of cases, women are not being informed and not getting true informed consent. Once UFE is complete, are there any follow-up procedures needed? Um, typically, no. We will follow the patient until they obviously recover, um, and we see everyone back um, three months after the UFE procedure. 
Um, at three months, we check on all of their symptoms to make sure, hopefully, they've said that all of their symptoms are significantly better or gone by then. And then we look at the MRI uh, pictures, as I showed you, that we get an MRI with and without contrast on the follow-up. And it's those post-contrast images on the follow-up that are the most important because when we inject contrast into the uterus, the uterus is alive, it has a blood supply, so it will enhance brightly with the contrast, but none of the fibroids should enhance, meaning there's no blood supply to the, any of the fibroids. The fibroids are dead. Now, they'll also shrink, which is nice. Um, as you saw in the pictures I showed, sometimes the shrinking can be to nothing or near nothing, um, but they don't have to shrink at all. All they have to be is dead, and the woman's symptoms um, will disappear. So that's really important. If, they, if, if all the fibroids are dead on the three-month follow-up and the patient can tell they're better, they'll do great, and I'll likely never need to see them ever again. Has there been a case where the procedure failed? Yes, it's not perfect, it's not 100%. As I mentioned, the success rate in my hands is well over 90%. Now in that remaining close to 10%, um, the biggest um, group of patients in that small group is patients that have a secondary blood supply to the fibroids. The fibroids may be so big that not only are they fed by uterine branches, but ovarian arteries, ovarian arterial branches can feed them. So that's why the three-month follow-up is so important because if the patient at the three-month follow-up, and this is unusual, if the patient says they can't really tell they're any better and we look at the MRI with contrast and see that, the, say, the dominant fibroid is alive, it's, it's enhancing, it shouldn't. If it's enhancing like the uterus, meaning it's still alive, and that explains why the patient hasn't gotten better, in patients that are not interested in fertility, we can go into those ovarian arterial branches and embolize the supply coming off the ovarian branches and take care of most of the remaining small percentage that don't initially get the result that they were looking for. So um, there's a very small percentage of patients that don't get the relief one way or the other. Why are doctors so against alternative procedures, even if it is better for the patient than a high-risk procedure? Well, it's kind of a very general question. I mean, um, it could be a multifaceted answer. I mean, um, some physicians are reluctant to change. Um, this has been 20 years for fibroids. I mean, um, it's enough already. But, you know, just like pharmaceutical reps know that once they get a physician to write a, pres a prescription for a specific medication, they're usually pretty solid and they're very reluctant to change. And I think change is hard uh, for physicians. Um, but this has been, you know, say 20 years, over 20 years now, um, and it's well proven safe and effective. Women don't want to be operated on. Um, it's just we need to stop doing all the unnecessary hysterectomies in this country and start offering what's best for patients regardless of who's performing the procedure. Can women have children after UFE? Absolutely can. I've had a number of children um, born after UFE. I've had two sets of twins born after. Now, it is a longer discussion with patients if they're interested in fertility. Um, there's no you know, right or wrong answer. Um, sometimes I'll tell patients that I think myomectomy is in their best interest. Sometimes I will say that I think UFE is in their best interest. Sometimes a third alternative, what's called MRI-guided focused ultrasound, which is another uh, procedure that is um, non-invasive that's uh, used to treat fibroids. That procedure um, is really best for one fibroid or a couple of very small fibroids and has kind of a niche. Um, it's not, for, it's not uh, for the vast majority of patients, but some patients, um, uh, MRI-guided focused ultrasound may be uh, something that I'll recommend. But you have to look at the individual patient. You have to talk to them. Our consultation takes like 45 minutes. It's pretty extensive. We talk about their symptoms, if they've ever had surgery before. Uh, it depends on truly how many fibroids they have because 
ultrasound, which all of these patients or almost all of them have had, um, and it's often what's uh, diagnosed their original condition having fibroids is an ultrasound with their doctor's office. But ultrasound dramatically underestimates the fibroid burden. And so we use MRI, which is, as I showed you in the pictures, the resolution of MRI is vastly better uh, than any ultrasound image. And so you really get a much better detailed evaluation of the uterus. You can really see how many uh, fibroids they truly have. Because I'll have patients say, well, I know I have two fibroids in my uterus. I've had them for years. And you get the MRI, and they've got 10 or 15 or 20, um, just because the resolution of MRI is so much better. And that's important information for women deciding about their fertility, because um, both fibroid embolization and myomectomy do impact a woman's fertility. Um, surgery can, cutting on the uterus significantly drops a woman's fertility. So um, you have to have a very, you know, you have to look at how many fibroids she has. If, In general, a very young woman with a very few fibroids that can be surgically managed, until we have more data on fertility, we've been recommending myomectomy for those patients. Alternatively, the older the patient is and the more numerous fibroids, I saw a woman today who was in her late 30s and had probably 40 or 50 fibroids, that lady is more, better served with fibroid embolization. Um, she's got so many fibroids in her uterus, they couldn't possibly even get the majority of them out. Um, she's going to be left one way or the other with lots of living fibroids that will grow, and then she'll need a second procedure down the line. So the more numerous fibroids and the older a woman is, I think that's where UFE really comes into play. Is there a certain time the procedure can be performed with regard to the progression of the fibroid? A certain time that the procedure can be performed be related to their menstrual? I mean, the procedure can be performed at any time during the menstrual. Um, it's, not, it's not, you can perform it any day. The patient can be on their menstrual. It can be, it can be performed at any time, if that's what, if that's what they were asking. What is the cost comparison of a hysterectomy versus UFA? Well, the, the cost of actually the procedure itself is less than hysterectomy. For, for UFE, it's roughly around $10,000. For hysterectomy, it's more like 12 to 15, but that can go up dramatically more if the patient stays in the hospital. Um, UFE is an outpatient procedure. But where the biggest difference in cost, and still several thousand dollars is a big difference, um, but and a much bigger cost is what is the cost, you know, associated with somebody being out of work six to eight weeks or more from surgery versus five to seven days with UFE. And that's a huge difference in productivity, a huge difference in cost, um, so in, in terms of total cost, UFE is much, much less costly than uh, surgery. Have there been any cases where a patient has sued their gynecological practice for not offering the UFE as an alternative? Uh, I'm not aware that, you know, and I'm not, I'm certainly, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a legal expert. Um, I'm, I'm certainly an expert in fibroids, and I have done some expert work in the fibroid arena. Um, I'm not aware, uh, certainly could have happened, but I'm not aware of any case where someone was sued for not informing, um, underwent hysterectomy, and then sued um, after the fact for not being informed. Um, could that have, uh, certainly that scenario could be present, it could have happened, um, I have not heard of such a case. What causes fibroids to develop? I wish I knew. Um, nobody knows that answer. Um, and hopefully, I mean, it's, it's only been very recent that actually the NIH and others have really set a fibroid research agenda. It's, um, it's very low on the research priority. Um, cancer and heart disease and HIV and 
uh, get a lot of the research dollars. It, it's really low because it's a benign condition, even though a lot of people suffer with it, um, and people have very significant uh, morbidity with fibroids. Uh, unfortunately, it's well down the research priority list, and it's been only recently that um, there's been more attention given to fibroids, and hopefully we will find uh, why it occurs. We, we, we know the chromosome, at the chromosome level, um, what chromosome is involved, but we don't know, we haven't gotten to the gene level yet, and so that still awaits further research. How do you know if you have fibroids, and what are the symptoms? The main symptoms are heavy bleeding, pelvic pain, uh, and increased urinary frequency. Um, usually, most commonly, a woman will have really heavy periods, and they'll go to their physician suffering with these heavy periods, and they will either, um, it'll be diagnosed either on physical exam, you can feel these hard tumors um, on a bimanual physical exam or an ultrasound, it'll be confirmed with ultrasound imaging. Um, a pelvic ultrasound um, will then corroborate the physician's findings on physical exam. Um, that's the most common reason. Sometimes they're incidentally picked up with no symptoms. A woman is pregnant, um, she's, she has a baby and they're looking at the baby under ultrasound and see fibroids present in the uterus um, and she has not had any symptoms. A lot of women have fibroids um, their whole life, and they have no symptoms. And they, if they have no symptoms, they don't need any treatment. Um, the only exception to that is if these fibroids that are not causing any symptoms, if it's uh, deemed preventing a woman from getting pregnant who's trying to get pregnant or causing a woman who uh, is getting pregnant but miscarrying, if that's deemed the cause, then that's the one exception to treat someone who, who has no symptoms uh, those fibroids uh, will be treated. Um, but that wouldn't be with UFE. That would uh, currently be with either surgery or uh, focused ultrasound. Is there a way fibroids can be reduced so surgery is not needed, or do you opt for surgery or UFE procedures? Well, we try first um, uh, an anti-estrogen approach because estrogen stimulates fibroids to grow. So we'll um, try to get an anti-estrogen approach, which is exercise, um, eating right, weight loss, try to lose excess body fat. Um, for patients that have, you know, m mild symptoms or not terribly disabling symptoms, they can really, you could treat your fibroids effectively with losing excess body fat, trying to avoid the big hormonal offenders in the food supply, um, chicken, red meat, uh, dairy. Um, you can do workarounds for that. Um, there are certain, if trying to avoid those hormone-rich foods um, and substituting them with more fruits and vegetables, particularly the colored fruits and vegetables, which have flavonoids in them. They're compounds that actually block an important enzyme in, in estrogen biosynthesis. So there are nutritional ways that at least will help your symptoms. Um, for people that have really bad uh, fibroids, really bad symptoms, um, that might not take care of it enough, but it's a good first step for a lot of people, um, either in the prevention or if they have mild, uh, mild symptoms, um, they can really make a significant impact and treat their fibroid symptoms pretty effectively with some significant uh, changes in their lifestyle. So that's where we like to start. Um, if that fails, then um, you can try some medical therapies, uh, uh, one of the common ones, unfortunately, is birth control pills, which does um, thin the lining of the uterus, leading to lighter flows. So for women that are having heavy periods, the problem is, obviously, birth control pills have estrogen and progesterone in them, and that will stimulate fibroid growth. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. There is another medicine called tranexamic acid, um, which can be used for up to five days every month and will lighten flow, and we've used that effectively for some patients with just bleeding symptoms alone. Um, and they will take it just on a heavy day for up to five days a month, um, and we'll get some very nice relief with that. Uh, for patients that fail both kind of behavioral modification, dietary stuff, and medical, um, then you're often left with UFE. 
Um, surgery should be the last resort. Hysterectomy for fibroids should be the absolute last resort. And unfortunately, most commonly today, it's the first and only option women are hearing about. And that's why it's so important to educate people. And uh, I really appreciate everyone's time today. I hope they found it to be very helpful. Which country has performed the most UFA procedures? I'm, I believe it's the United States. Um, in Europe, they are performing UFE. Um, Asia has been kind of the last uh, continent to kind of get involved. Um, but uh, I, I believe U the U.S. is by far uh, the world's leader in performing UFE, even though its origins are in France. Um, At what age can fibroids first be visible? We've seen some, actually, uh, we've seen some teenagers. It, it's more, fibroids are more common in African-American women, um, and they develop them at an earlier age. Um, and we've seen some teenagers with fibroids, and um, we have not treated any teenagers that have them, but you can see them um, as early as the teen years. Usually it's an adult condition before you actually see fibroids. And sometimes patients know about fibroids, say, in their tw early 20s, uh, but they're not an issue till their 30s or 40s. So typically for many women, it's, it's not an issue until they're, say, in their 30s or 40s. Uh, they may have known about it at an earlier age. But again, if they're causing any symptoms. How do you detect fibroids? Um, you can detect them on physical exam, or you can detect them on imaging, most commonly pelvic ultrasound, um, which is often done in, in a doctor's office. Once they suspect a woman has fibroids, they'll often get an ultrasound to confirm that. We use MRI, which is, to say, much higher resolution uh, than ultrasound, and, and you can see things much to much greater detail. But Can fibroids resolve themselves? Um, they can. Women can go their whole life with fibroids, and when they hit menopause, they won't be an issue anymore. So um, some women can, a lot of women can make it their whole life having fibroids, no symptoms, no treatment, get to menopause, and that's it. It's fine. It's no issue. Okay, thank you for all of those questions and thank you for your answers. And I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending and most especially Dr. John C. Littman for his time and willingness to present such a controversial topic. If you would like to speak with Dr. Littman or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TASA 1-800-523 2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. This concludes our program for today, but the TASA group is in addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years. TASA also offers e-discovery and forensic solutions, free interactive webinars, cybersecurity services, and day in the life videos. Research reports on expert witnesses, challenge history report 2.0, preliminary screening report, and expert profile 360. Thank you. We will be sending out the link to the archive recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. The archive recording will also be posted in the Knowledge Center on TASA's website at www.tasanet.com. Thank you for listening to our presentation, and thank you to Dr. John C. Littman. That concludes our program for today. Thanks very much.